started. Hi there, everyone. My name is Graham Celine. I am the uh, VP of Marketing here at Coda Z, and I'm very happy to host this session and welcome you to this interactive discussion about girls in STEM. Today, together with you, we'll address the question on how to close the gender gap in STEM and STEAM education. We're honored to have as our speaker today, Dr. Megan Pollack. Pollock. Dr. Pollock serves as the Executive Director of Design Connect Create, a nonprofit organization that empowers young women to be successful in STEM courses in order to close the gender gap in STEM careers. Megan was a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow, and she holds a PhD in engineering education from Purdue University, an MS in electrical engineering from Texas Tech University, and a BS in computer science from Texas Women's University. As an engineer turned educator, Megan is focused on engineering equity into education and the workforce. We're happy to have her with us today. Thank you for being here, Megan. Glad to be here. For those of you that are not familiar with Coda Z, and we ran that poll just because we wanted to see that, more than half of you don't have never heard of Coda Z or CCC, CRCC, so I'm going to take just a minute to tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, Coda Z is an online platform uh, for STEM education. Uh, this cyber robotics program is a learning environment that allows students anywhere to learn about programming 3D simulated robots, both in the classroom and in competition. The accompanying competition that goes with uh, Coda Z, or the CRCC, Cyber Robotics Coding Competition, uh, was run in 2017 with over 200,000 participants worldwide in 14 states in the USA, and what's most important, 47% of the participants were female. At Coda Z, we're passionate about accessibility, getting STEM to the other 99% to all students. Our aim is to make STEM, robotics and coding available to all genders and all schools. That's why we asked Megan to address the topic of gender in STEM. You can learn more about Coda Z. Um, Whoops, something happened to my slides here. Oh dear. I'm sorry, I, I clicked on the wrong link and something started playing. Uh, so you can learn more about Coda Z by visiting our website, gocodaz.com or by following Coda Z on Facebook or Twitter. Just a few technicalities before we get started. Uh, we'll re be recording the session and we'll share the recording with you. So if you feel, so feel free to share this with colleagues who may have missed the session. This is a question and answer, ask me anything session. So we need your questions. To submit a question, simply type it into the question box in the lower right corner of the GoToWebinar control panel. Megan and I will try and answer your questions during the session. So let's get the start, the session started. Uh, Megan, Dr. Pollack, the floor is all yours. I'm gonna all make right, thank you. you. Hold on, I gotta make Excellent. you the presenter and then you can <laughs> go ahead. Okay. All right, well, we're getting that set up. I want to, to welcome you all. I'm excited to be here today to talk with you about gender equity in STEM or STEAM or whatever is your favorite acronym. Um, are we able to get the, the presenter mode sent to me? Okay, right. we'll keep waiting. We'll keep waiting for that. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I am the executive director of Design Connect Create, and we are busy right now planning lots of fun summer camps for girls. And what's unique about the programs that we offer is that they are academically focused. And so our primary offering that we've had since the inception of the organization is based on physics. Uh, we Because physics is such a pivotal course, a gatekeeping course for those students who go into and choose STEM careers. And so 
we help get girls excited and ready for their physics course that they'll be taking in the fall. And so we have 10 camps across the state of Texas uh, this year. And so you can certainly look up on our website, Design Connect Create, to learn more. In addition, I run a consulting firm called 70 Ventures. And in that, uh, working with teachers and teaching them how to improve their practice so that they can uh, be the most equitable educators possible. All right. We've got the slideshow now showing. Um, all right, perfect. Uh, so the the other work that I do is through the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity. I've worked with this organization for the last decade, and we provide teacher professional development focused on educational equity. So to get us started, I wanted to tell you a little bit of a story, a story about my life and my experience and how I how I came to the place that I am. So like so many of our students that we serve, they have big dreams for themselves. And so when I was a little girl, I had dreams. I wanted to travel the world. I wanted to do work that that impacted others. Um, I have to say, I'm pretty sure I was the first student in my entire school to have uh, what was used to be called a personal digital assistant. And so I remembered thinking like I'm carrying my PDA, I'm carrying my camera, I'm carrying all these other kinds of things. What if I could put them all together? And unfortunately, I was doesn't want to invent the iPhone, but I feel like I was right there thinking with them as they were doing that work. I also knew that I wanted to work with other people and I wanted to make a difference in the world. And so it was important to me that I find work that will allow me to do that. And finally, my goal is to live on the beach and I'm still working on this one. And the reason why I tell you these things is that work values are the choices that uh, we often face when we're looking to find careers and jobs that we want. And then too often, uh, we don't help students understand how work values play into the decisions that we make and the careers that we choose. And work values are critical. So the, the better your work values, the better your jobs align with your work values, the happier you're going to be, right? And we want to have happy lives. We want the students that we serve to have happy lives. And so early on, I began to think about what are the things that I care about? And these are four of the primary work values that influence how uh, we enjoy our careers. And we have intrinsic values, this idea of loving what you do. Extrinsic values, this dream of making money and having good job security. Prestige values, this is this interest in having a really respected occupation and being valued for what you contribute. And four, social values, this is a value that you want to work with people and you want to contribute and make a difference in society. And so, so often when we think about STEM careers, we tend to pitch more of the extrinsic values, this notion that, yes, you're going to make a lot of money and there are jobs that are in demand. And we don't take the time and we don't always have the right language to help our students see that STEM careers are really aligned with all of the different kinds of work values that students have. So let me start with a story. When I was a student in school, um, I took every AP math and science course that was available. I had coded through my grade school years for five years. I started in eighth grade. Um, I remember very clearly the first time that I programmed the, the first code that you ever write where it outputs hello world. I remember that moment of excitement and joy of knowing what I created. Um, both my father and my grandfather are programmers. And so it was really fun to get to, to learn how to code and to talk to my granddad and my dad about what I was learning. I was president of the robotics club and we uh, did lots of competitions, not in the same way that they are now, um, but I was involved in that group and a leader in that group. Uh, I was top of my class. And so there is every indication that I was interested in STEM. And I doubt that any of you would, would disagree, right? All of my teachers, they knew that I had this background and they knew that um, I seemed to be interested in it. But when it came time for me to select my career, I didn't select a STEM career. I initially applied to, to college to study interior design. Now, interestingly enough, I thought I wanted to be an architect, but I didn't go for that. I thought that interior design was more appropriate for, for, for women. Now, I want to talk about how there's such a differential between this uh, 
external, you know, indication of, of how much I love these things and how that didn't convert to my career choice. And that's really going to help us understand how gender equity is really influencing the choice uh, of our students and what they're choosing uh, as far as college pathways. So what I'm introducing to you here is a framework that's designed by the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity, and they call it the culture wheel. And it starts with this notion that there are cultural stereotypes. There are cultural stereotypes about all kinds of things. And these stereotypes influence how we begin to view the world and see uh, other people and, and to see different kinds of jobs. As an example, Growing up, I uh, was very aware of this sort of stereotype of the, the archetype, the archetypical engineer being somewhat like Dilbert. And it was really perpetuated in my community. I grew up in southeast Texas, and so it's chemical refinery plants and paper mills. And everyone that I knew that was in a you know, science and engineering job worked at those plants, and they were all of my friends' dads. Um, and my dad... And my granddad looked a little bit like Dilbert. Um, and so growing up, what had happened is this single story had been created about what I thought it meant to be a STEM professional. This sort of, it reiterated this sort of notion of having to be a nerd. And if you're going to be smart, then you then you aren't going to have fun. And it was such a, you know, distinct polarity between what I thought it meant to have the life that I wanted and what I thought it meant to be a STEM professional. And there's an amazing TED Talk, if you haven't seen it, called The Danger of the Single Story uh, by Chimamanda Adichie. If you just Google that, it's the first thing that comes up. And the quote that I love most and really the pivotal point of her talk is she says that the single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make that one story become the only story. And so again, it's it's not that the stereotypes are untrue, right? Because it fits my dad and my granddad and it fits a lot of the people that were in the community that I grew up, but it's incomplete. If our students, particularly our young women, are looking at who goes into these careers and what they see are people who don't look like them and what they see are qualities that don't mirror the, the qualities that they see in themselves or that they want to see in themselves, they begin to opt out of those pathways. And so when we have these cultural stereotypes, these stereotypes become unconscious implicit biases that we hold about these things. And the way implicit bias works is you don't actually have to believe that that stereotype is singular. But if your brain has more narratives, more stories that fit that archetype, your brain will unconsciously draw on those stories and, in, and influence how you interact with others. And this is what we call micro messages. Micro messages are the manifestation of unconscious bias. And they micro messages occur in a variety of ways. Um, that's in what we say, how we say it. It's in what we choose to say and what not to say. It's what the images that our, see, our students see in their classroom, it's in what they see in the curriculum, it's what they see hanging on the walls, it's the, the body language. There are so many ways that micro messages are manifested in how we communicate. And then there are good messages and bad messages, micro affirmations and micro inequities. And micro inequities are what's so critical when we think about in this work. And it's the accumulation of these messages. So again, if you were to look at all of the things that I had done, you know, in my high school career, you would think that I would have had lots of positive messages that said that I should go into STEM because it certainly wasn't my parents weren't telling me I shouldn't go in STEM. Uh, it wasn't my teachers. It was a lot of other messages from the world, from the media, from the environment, from the classrooms, from the culture, those implicit, subtle messages that accumulated in just enough of a way that made me think that STEM wasn't for me. And what that accumulation does is it affects our students' self-efficacy. And I'm going to go into self-efficacy a little bit deeper in a minute, but self-efficacy is the belief that one has that they can accomplish a task. And if you have that belief, whether it's that you can or can't do it, it affects your behavior. And so if our young women continue to get cultural stereotypes that are reinforcing reinforcing negative micro messages and they get that accumulation that affects their self-efficacy and says, you know what, this isn't for me. I'm going to go choose something else. And the research tells us that girls tend to choose 
how to do science and math and engineering in a way that aligns with their gendered stereotype. And that's again, due to this accumulation of messages. And the point of interruption is us as educators beginning to think about what are the unconscious biases that I might hold and how are those manifesting in my communication, in my classroom, in the culture, in the environments that I serve students and how do I begin to interrupt that cycle? And so when we look at this framework and understand that there are lots of influences that affect our students and how they can succeed in their classrooms, it begins to help us break down and understand the ways that we can address that. So let me jump back on this notion of, of continuing through my story. So despite the fact that growing up I had this sort of archetype you know, image of what a scientist and engineer was, I thought that the that STEM really was focused also, if you wanted to help people, then you had to be a doctor. And let me tell you what, I've never been good with blood. I am still not very good with blood. And of all the things I ever considered, it was never medicine. And so I thought, well, I guess I'm not gonna be able to help people in the way that I wanted. And so I uh, eventually, I did get to choose a career path in STEM. And the reason why is I had one educator, the week of my graduation year, approach me and tell me about an opportunity and say, Megan, this is for you. You're equipped for this, you're prepared for this. And so then I did uh, change, I changed colleges and paths and everything and then went on to study computer science and engineering. And so when I became a practicing engineer, I worked for Texas Instruments and TI, most of us know TI as the people who make the calculators. That's less than 2% of the actual business of TI. And I worked for a business group called DLP. And so we made a chip like you see on the screen and like the one that I'm holding up in, in front of the video camera. And so this chip was really fun to work on. And so you'll see that the gold part is actually, uh, it's it's made out of uh, partly gold and this bottom piece is made out of ceramic and there are gold leads on the bottom and then this is has glass over the top but then in the center is an array of tiny mirrors and so you can see in the the slide here that there are tons of tiny mirrors they are one atom thick made out of aluminum and one atom thick and so what you see blown up there is an image of an ant's leg to give you perspective of how small these tiny mirrors are. There are about a quarter of a million to half a million mirrors in this tiny silver area that you see. And each of these one mirrors, they're sitting on top of each, uh, on top of the superstructure and we turn them on and off. And so if you go to the, the cinema, you are very likely to get to see, um, you'll be use, they'll be using a, a DLP cinema projector. It's, I think, like an 85% chance uh, that the, the projector in the back is made out of that. Now, when I was working as an engineer, I thought that was cool. You know, DLP had won some Oscars for how their work had transformed uh, technology. But I didn't, I didn't love going to the movies to that much, and it didn't really thrill me. But what I loved is that the same technology that I worked on, a different kind of chip, but again, the same technology, uh, would go into a medical device that would help babies. It would help big babies too. Uh, but, but how many of you have ever been to, to get blood drawn and they miss your veins or they have a hard time finding your veins and you walk out of there with a huge bruise uh, from all of their efforts? Well, if you ever or at the hospital, ask them if they have a vein viewer. And what that does is it uses the same digital micro mirror device and, and uses infrared light and then you hold the vein viewer over the skin and it illuminates where the veins are under the skin. And so it was so rewarding for me to get to work on a technology that I knew was impacting and helping, helping babies. And so what that brings me to summarize here is that one single technology that I worked on could make us happy at the movies, it can improve our health, that's the image of the vein viewer how uh, the how the handheld part works and also safety the same kind of technology goes into vehicles now in the head-up display and so if you have in your car where the image is projected onto like a little shield or up onto the windshield it's the same kind of technology the same type of chip that is in all of these technologies. And so our students need to understand that STEM professionals are essential for not only our happiness and the fun iPhones that we get to have, but our health and our safety as well. And this brings me to, uh, to the uh, a report that the National Academy of Engineering came out with. Uh, it's been about a decade now, but it's still certainly 
incredibly relevant. And it helps us to understand what are the messages that students need to know to really engage and understand uh, what they can do in STEM. And so it was literally a market analysis study. They hired a team of marketers to ask engineers, what is it that you do? And so then they took that list of things that engineers did, and then they created statements. And then they asked a bunch of students to rate what are the statements that resonate most with you? And these are some of the top statements that resonated most with students. That, that STEM professionals make a world of difference and help shape the future. That STEM careers are essential to our health, happiness, and safety. And that STEM professionals are creative and collaborative problem solvers. So often when we talk about STEM, our students see the price tag. They see the price tag that STEM takes lots of work. It's going to be lots of math and science. It's going to be all these things to which they're stepping back and saying, that's not for me. But if instead we changed how we pitch and how we market STEM to help them understand these different uh, motivations, they're going to be more likely to want to engage. They're going to have higher motivation and interest to pursue STEM and uh, STEM activities. And so I, I challenge you to reflect on the work that you're doing and how are you really reinforcing these messages. And again, you can download this report from the internet, changingtheconversation.org. Um, it's, it's free to download. And really understand how can you align your work to these messages. And so with that, I, I want to lead us to having a little bit of a conversation about self-efficacy. And that, that's a great lead in there, uh, uh, Megan, maybe uh, just before you uh, and, and you can carry on. I'm just want to. We're getting a bunch of questions, and and so I wanted to push just in the direction because I think you're you're leading yes. about where the bias uh, comes from, or where the, the the part of the problem comes from, versus giving that positive message. Uh, when I look at the questions that are coming, they're all pretty practical. Um, they they kind of go back to the classroom, and so you know, for example, Jolene Keller from uh, is asking. Uh, appreciate ideas on getting a gender balance in middle school STEM classes when there are optional electives that students choose. So it's it's kind of, uh, it, it, we're not even getting to that point of of, um, create, of of messaging to the students, so engaging with the students, but they, they're choosing by themselves and their parents are even choosing for them. Uh, if, and, and so maybe uh, talk sure. a bit about how we can so do that. So the research tells us that girls begin to make the decision at fourth and fifth grade that math is either for them or not for them. And this is in spite of the fact that girls go on to take just as many math and science classes as boys, but yet they do not pursue careers in STEM at the same rate as boys. And again, this is related to the amount of messages that they're receiving in their life from their media, from the media, from their parents, from the, the world around them, unconscious messages that they're receiving from their educators, the messages that they see in the classroom, the role models, and some of the things I wanna share with you around self-efficacy here in a minute. And so the question was, how do we get a, a gender balance in middle school classrooms when they're optional electives? So first of all, I would encourage you to, to figure out a way for STEM courses to not be electives that when we begin to allow that choice to happen so early on, they, they change their life trajectories when they have the option to opt out of something to which they've been unintentionally and unconsciously discouraged from these pathways. And so when you have opportunities to create parity in those classrooms, I would encourage you to do so. Um, even if you want, to, if you have to maintain it as elective, I would encourage you to enforce that you are going to accept half boys and half girls and that if you don't have the girls we must go recruit them we must go and invite them to do that and there are tons of strategies on recruiting but the number one way to recruit girls into into activities is to recruit them in in groups and so if you can get them to come as a cohort they're mo more likely to, to enter into those opportunities and stick with those opportunities uh, as a a follow on, and I'm picking from another question here. Is there's, there's a question from uh, Risto Conti uh, about which I think is just as relevant as how to socialize girls into STEM within the family. So, how do you extend that message out uh, to the parents that are helping them make those decisions? Any ideas on that? 
Yeah, so the best way to help socialize girls into STEM are to allow them to play, allow them to understand that when they are being creative, that they are uh, solving problems. And you really want to help them to connect creativity with problem solving. Because so often we sort of have these, again, disparate views. If you are either a creative artsy person or you're a math and science person. In reality, our world and our industries and, and the work that we, the problems that we have to solve require both. And so one of the things that's so critical, and I'd like to talk about it as it relates to self-efficacy, is in how we provide feedback to students. And so, again, our girls are socialized from very early on. We are gendered to think that it's our job to nurture. It's our job to take care of others. It's our job to help people. And so what happens is, is by, by gendering our students, our, our girls to have this worldview, they tend to opt for helping professions. They tend to opt to be nurses. They tend to opt to be teachers and counselors. They tend to opt uh, to even studying biology because they think that that's sort of that how they're going to help people. And so what we have to do is to challenge stereotypes. When you see a stereotype as a parent, when you see a stereotype as an aunt and uncle or anyone who has influence over students, you must challenge those stereotypes and help them to really understand that they have the ability to make a difference and shape the world by being creative and by solving problems that are really going to make a difference uh, in the lives that, that all of us have ahead of us. And so again, it's about challenging stereotypes. It's about really being conscious of what uh, ways that bias might be manifesting in your language. Uh, think to yourself, like, uh, how many of you either have said in your life or have had a parent uh, who said, I'm not a math person, go ask another parent. This happens so often. In my family, my mom always said, no, nope, math, math's not for me, go ask your dad. And so that subtle message begins to create in me this mindset unconsciously, well, maybe I'm not supposed to be good at math. And that's how these messages are perpetuated. So if you as a parent or as an educator have any fear of math, I implore you to stop perpetuating this sort of fear of math. We would never go around saying, oh, I, I don't read, I can't read, right? But we've made it okay to walk around and say, oh, I can't, I don't do math. What we know about math is with effort, you can figure it out. And that's what we want to, to, to help our students with, is figuring out how they can engage and, and learn more. So do you want me to answer another question or can I talk a little bit about self-efficacy and how that plays into all of... Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Sure. So self-efficacy, remember that's really what triggers the behavior. So it's this belief that you have that you can accomplish a task. It could be a big task, a small task, complex task or very simple task. And it answers the question, can I do this? And why this is important is high self-efficacy predicts academic achievement while self-esteem does not. Self-esteem answers the question, how do I feel about myself? Uh, and self-efficacy again answers the question, can I do this? So when our students have high self-efficacy, they have greater interest, achievement, motivation, engagement, persistence, performance, all things that we want from them, right? But if they have a low self-efficacy, they are more likely to doubt, fear, and avoid tasks. And so this, again, this, this is for our high achieving students. This is for students across the entire continuum of learning that all of them are constantly facing this question of, can I do this? Can I do this task? Can I enter into this career? Can I join the robotics club? Can I do this after school STEM program? Can I take this you know, programming class? They're, they're making all of these decisions. And so how our students develop the self-efficacy are based on four primary sources. The first source are mastery experiences, previous experiences that, and performance that suggests that they can enter into those tasks. Now, I'll pick on robotics a little bit here. So growing up, um, well, one, we didn't have any Legos at my house because they're kind of, they're super expensive, right? Uh, but my, one of our family friends did, and they had an entire closet, which was basically a huge walk-in closet that was the Lego room. And what had happened is that became the boys' playroom. The girls weren't allowed. And so I didn't have the opportunity to grow up playing with these Legos. Well, so what happens when our girls who may be like me get to high school 
And the only way in which they are invited to do STEM is through some kind of robotics exercise. And they don't have previous experience playing with these kinds of toys that immediately doesn't offer them a level playing field. And so mastery experience, it's, it's, it's saying, I've done this, therefore I think I can do that. And it's this constant question that they're asking, can I do this? Have I have done other things that signal I can do that? The second source are vicarious experiences. This is the observation of models, of role models. And the research tells us that this is one of the most influential sources of self-efficacy for young women entering into STEM pathways is they need to see people who look like them, that they can relate with, who've gone in, into these pathways. And those role models might be people who are already in their career, that might be students who are in college and studying STEM, or it might be upperclassmen in the schools that, that the students attend. The third source of self-efficacy is social persuasion. This is feedback and support from others. And so, as I mentioned, I had that one teacher give me feedback and she said, Megan, this is for you. You're prepared for this. You're interested in this and it's going to be right for you. What she didn't know, Dr. Estes didn't know at that moment, is that she was boosting my self-efficacy. And what we call that is called, uh, I like to call it sticky feedback. Uh, so I remember growing up as a kid and at the grocery store, if you, you know, as you leave the grocery store, it had these little machines, you put a quarter in and you get, you know, either like a little bouncy ball or you get this sort of like throw at the wall sticky thing, right? So feedback is kind of like this. So often our feedback is like, add a boy, add a girl, you've got it. Uh, I like to call that bouncy ball feedback. All it is, is it's just saying, it's giving, you know, some kind of feedback. But sticky feedback, it combines mastery experiences with social persuasion, and that is going to stick with them. When you give feedback that says, like my teacher did, and she says, Megan, you're good at this, you're prepared for this, look at all the things that you've done, that feedback has stuck with me, and, it, and I never forgot it. Whereas if she just would have walked by and said, sure, this is, you know, you can do it, do you think it would have really changed my self-efficacy? Not really. And so I want us to really reflect on how are we providing feedback to our students. In addition, when we think about micro-messaging, the research tells us that both men and women are more likely to praise girls for how pretty their work is than for the quality of their work. And this is so subtle. And we have to begin to catch ourselves before we say those things so that we help them understand that the value and quality of their work is really critical. And so I, it looks like we have a question that's asking about curriculum. Um, let's see. Let's find that question here. Um, so we have a question from Gina that says affordable STEM projects are expensive. Where can I find um, affordable project materials from a computer labs? You can't make a mess. And let's see. There was another um, question on curriculum as well. Um, if we want to call that one out. I want to bring your attention to some of my favorite curriculum that's available. The first, it's absolutely free, is teachengineering.org. And what I love about teachengineering.org is all of the curriculum on their website is one, it's free, and two, it's been evaluated by engineering education professionals like myself. And it also, they have gone to great lengths to ensure that the curriculum aligns to the changing the conversation messages. Remember those three messages that I was telling you about, that engineers make a world of difference and help shape the future, that, that, um, that engineer, that STEM careers are essential to our health, our happiness, and our safety, and that STEM professionals are creative and collaborative problem solvers. Another curriculum that I really love is called is from the Boston Museum of Science and so they've got engineering curriculum for every level of student some of them are free some of them um, are low cost and then some of them do require different kinds of things to set up that uh, but I encourage you to go to the website and explore that explore that Another curriculum, it's really not a curriculum, it's more like an approach, is called novel engineering. And novel engineering is this concept of you take a, a novel that a student already has to read for school, and this really aligns with the research that says by integrating our education, our students learn more. So if they're going to read a novel, then they're going to read the novel to understand how could I have helped the characters in this book? 
what is it that I can engineer and problem solve to, to serve them? And so one of the camps that I'm running this summer, I'm using this approach, and the book that the students are going to be reading is called A Long Walk to Water. And so they will read the book and they will reflect on what is it that they can do to help the characters in that book. And then when we come together for our camp, they're going to learn about the engineering design process, they're going to learn about constraints, and they're going to learn about how they can solve those problems. And it's, it's student-led and that they get to pick the problems that they're going to solve. And another curriculum, which is also approach, is from Purdue University, and it's called EPICS, which means Engineering Projects and Community Service. And this is also a really great curriculum that I encourage you to check out. Um, and so, and, and these all have varying levels of messiness and materials that are required to do that. So I encourage you to explore those. I, I Toma, forgive me if I just jump in, but uh, uh, this is, you know, everything you're saying just resonates so well with, with, with the experiences we've had as a, as a vendor in the marketplace. And uh, I do have to just sort of push on this robotics thing because that's one of the areas that we've seen uh, over the years. And, 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 you know, our company started in the, the robotics space and we, we worked a lot in that robotics uh, robotics clubs, uh, robotics engineering, uh, but we found that that's where the, a lot of the gender bias got built in. And when we moved to develop Code Z, using the concept of the the virtual robot was was really important to us because it removed a lot of the the, the stereotype of you have to be. Uh, uh, capable with tools or you have to be uh, strong uh, in any way and, and put it in a position where everybody could have the same access and took out the, any of the uh, intimidation factor that might have been in the robotics world. But the other side is that a huge part of the, the STEM environment is not just robotics, it's technology and engineering. And, and, and learning the technology is just as important as to learning what is very often interpreted as just the mechanical engineering side of robotics. Uh, so I, I hope that with, with Code Z we're, we're able to um, address those type of uh, easy introductions that, that are more uh, flexible for, uh, for both genders. Uh, yeah. Do you want to get to more questions or you want to just uh, respond to? Just... Well, I, I want to respond to what you just said. So one of the things that we know about students and how they engage in science and, and any kind of other STEM courses, is that when there are manipulatives involved, whether that's a microscope, whether that's a robot, whatever it is, that girls are more likely to step back, to literally physically step back and let the boys take over. And again, that's from deeply rooted gendering of, of how we sort of learn to operate and take up space. And so I like what you said, Graham, and that it helps to sort of remove that. I watched uh, in my dissertation research a young woman. She was president of not one, but two robotics clubs. And in her engineering class, she would consistently step back and let the boys manage the robots. But if they were to get up and go to the bathroom, then she'd dive in and start manipulating it. And so, and she was doing that unconsciously. She didn't even realize that she was doing it. And so the more ways that we can be intentional about how watching and observing how our students are engaging with these materials, uh, the better served that they're gonna be. So I'm gonna read through some, uh, or, or there's, there's an interesting question here about the uh, shifting success in having more girls in STEM in the upper grades when there was a solid K-8 curriculum versus when they, they, they're, the K-8 is not as strong, uh, the bias sometimes might be built up early. How do you uh, address that when they get through to the old age groups? I think that the more opportunities our students have to engage with STEM in the K-8 grades, the better, right? We know that, that so often in, you know, K through three, they're not really engaging in uh, that much science and technology yet. Um, and so, so if you're if you have opportunity for girls to any student to engage in that, that's wonderful. But 
And to the same statistic that I was telling you earlier is that girls begin to make those decisions in fourth and fifth grade that, that a future in math and science or that the, the skill of math and science is either for them or not for them. It really sets in in fourth and fifth grade. And so we have to be really intentional about helping them to overcome those stereotypes and to overcome those unconscious biases that, that other people may be enforcing on them and that they may be unconsciously uh, adapting. And so I, I've seen that even if you have a solid K-8 curriculum in STEM, that if that curriculum isn't regularly assessed for, for gender bias, if those educators aren't participating in professional development that helps them minimize gender bias, then it may not necessarily support the girls in upper grades. I, I know that there are so many curriculums like the Boston Museum of Science Engineering curriculum, they are working to have curriculum at all the different levels. And they have, uh, these are some of my favorite developers of curriculum and that they have put so much thought into understanding how uh, educational equity plays a part into their work, not just for gender, but for, for, for girls and students of color and, from, and for students from different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. They really put a tremendous amount of thought in this. And even their teacher training begins to help address some of those issues as well. And so uh, I again encourage you to think about how are all the messages unintentionally maybe be maybe being perpetuated and reinforced in the curriculum. But if we if we can have a solid K-8 curriculum where students, every student gets to participate in these pathways, then sure they're going to be way more likely to stick in those pathways later on. Uh, there, the research also tells us though that, that girls begin to, they, there's tons of metaphors to describe this. The most popular one on this is looking at this, this sort of problem as a pipeline, right? And that there's a single pipeline and then there are sort of fallout points for girls in STEM pathways. Um, there's certainly the one in fourth and fifth grade, then there's the one at, in high school, and then there's the one in college, and then there's another dropout uh, once they get into industry. And that's related to not only their self-efficacy, but that's related to the culture and the climate of the places in which they are engaging. And so that's another key thing that we have to think about. You know, there are so many influences that affect our students. What's the culture that they are facing when they get into that classroom? If I'm the only female in a class full of 70 engineering students, true story, how welcome do I feel in that space? What's the climate and the culture that that space is, is have, has and how is it affecting whether I choose to persist in that pathway? And so we have to pay so much attention to that. The onus isn't just on the young girls, it's on us as educators and managing uh, the curriculum, the culture and the climate. That's, that's a fantastic point. And I'd like to take one of the questions that we got here and adapt it slightly. I mentioned earlier that uh, at Code Z, we, we, we also run the cyber robotics coding competition. And one of the, the points we focused on inclusiveness, we focus on uh, different types of schools so we can get to, to rural schools and then uh, 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 schools that are, are uh, somewhat limited in resources. But the, one of the big focuses around gender, and we had 47% girls, which was for us was fantastic. Uh, but we had a question that said, do we need to keep gender separated programs or competitions in order to strengthen the, the, the female participation in a lot of other sports and uh, uh, subjects? We do have that even, you know, the, 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 the question came and, and uh, brought up chess as an example where uh, the the genders are separated supposedly uh, to strengthen it. Is that the better approach or is the mixed approach better? So there are, there's research and opinions on both sides of this, this question. I will say that I went to a women's university and uh, not by choice, by the way, only because they gave me a full scholarship. But um, <laughs> but I had the most remarkable education there. And I truly believe that uh, by going and studying computer science, my undergrad in a, in a women's university, it helped eliminate a lot of the 
the cultural stereotypes and the unconscious bias that happens uh, when we have mixed gender classrooms. Now, when you're talking about you have 47%, there's a there's a theory called, you know, once you reach critical mass, it begins to shift the culture of the environment. And critical mass really begins to tip at about uh, 30%. And so once you get, you know, 30% of one gender in a space, then it begins the, the culture and climate of, of that of that group is no longer so dominated by one gender by one culture that that the the girls if they're at about 30 percent they have their own camaraderie and they begin to really contribute to that culture at a greater rate whereas if you have you know one or two girls in a class of 20 uh they the the culture that they bring to that space is going to constantly be overshadowed and so the value of having separate gendered activities is that you eliminate a lot of the the uh, embedded competitiveness, the embedded unconscious belief that the girls say it's not for me. It removes that notion of the girls, of the boys, excuse me, the boys taking over the manip manipulatives and doing so more so than the girls, then the girls aren't stepping back. And so the value of that is if you can remove that component, then that's fantastic. I do know that there are some, the, some of the issues for schools that are funded federally through the Perkins funding, you cannot have gender separated environments. And so if you're going to do, if you have an opportunity to, to have a gender segregated class, you please make sure that you check with the, the source of the funding to make sure that you aren't going to have issues with that. Um, if you have informal things after school, like different kinds of clubs, yes, you can absolutely do that. And there's tons of research that does show that those teams are incredibly successful and that the students who participate in those gender uh, separated teams uh, are better served. Now, the flip side of that is that you know, once our young women get into the workforce, hopefully choose a STEM pathway, uh, it will not be 50-50. It will not be all women. Uh, and and unless there's a very specific case of, uh, of a company that has just happened to hire all women, um, which I've never heard of. But we, we want to help our girls equip them to be successful in the real world. But we also want to acknowledge that if we can't get them into the pathway, then then they're never going to have the choice of whether they want to stay in the pathway. And so, um, yeah, there's cases, you know, there's a case on both sides of that question, and uh, it's a good one. And I think that if you are able to have opportunities for girls to work with just girls, that, that it's a great choice. I, I just to to kind of uh, take a different direction, just because I don't want to uh, uh, leave these questions out. There are a number of questions about uh, grants and funding uh, uh, and how to get started. Uh, for, for specifically for, for girls' uh, education? Yeah, so on the slide here, I've put up a, a URL to a pretty excellent resource for how you can find STEM education grants. So it's stemfinity.com. Stemfinity in and of itself is a great resource for you, um, but you can go to this domain um, and find grants all over the US. Um, most of the grants that, that you're probably gonna be looking for are either corporate or family foundation grants. And so they're gonna be community-based grants. Um, that Those are the ones you're gonna be more likely to, to receive. And so this website has a great list that you can start from um, and start applying to. De depending on where you live, you might try to engage in, um, at least in Texas, I know like Austin, they have a really uh or it's becoming a really robust uh co stem coalition of people who are, who are doing this work and so as many ways that you can engage in in the larger stem community within your uh within your region the more likely you are to find out about these grants and so um, this is a good resource to check out Thanks. Uh, any other questions that anybody wants to pipe in quickly?
I wanted to, let's see, I see a question here. Um, there's a question in the chat box. Do we have, do I have any suggestions on how to increase STEM across all academic areas? If I understand the question correctly, I think that the one of the best ways to increase STEM across all academic areas is to move away from a siloed approach to learning and to to, to do your very best to integrate learning. That when students, so, and that's the approach that I was telling you about the novel engineering, that's one way to do it. Uh, engineering is elementary that comes from the Boston Museum of Science. That is an integrated STEM approach. And so, you know, you're reading something and you're learning something from the reading and then you're having to apply that learning and then you're using math and science principles to solve problems. When students have opportunity to see connections across all of these different kinds of subjects, one, it's more meaningful for them, and two, they begin to see and apply uh, what they're learning, right? And so, you know, with the, the work that I'm gonna be doing this summer using the book, um, a long walk to water, there is a history lesson to this. There is a, uh, you know, a social studies lesson to this of, of understanding the impact of, you know, the lost boys in Sudan. And so, you know, the more ways that you can work with your other educators to integrate across the silos, the traditional silos, then you'll, I believe that you'll see a greater increase in, in STEM across all the different areas. One last question, um, and I and I this is from Anne Levinson. I, I somehow think that Anne might work for us, but uh, she's asking about uh, tools or online tools that would uh, that you would recommend to teach them that are good for both boys and girls. Um, I, I you know I, I'll let you think, but that's the approach that that Code Z has taken, and that that our approach is a completely online environment which allows it means that it means that students can can take the classes either in class at home in the library uh, it, it increases the accessibility and there's no um, bias or ability for uh, the teams or the student the students can work alone they can work in teams and uh, so it's, it's boy girl it's girls it's however they want and 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 then we've integrated a lot of the gamified approach which makes it far more attractive to to students of all uh, types and backgrounds um, but uh, if you have any other suggestions other than code Z yeah I, I... I am not super aware of all the different options of online tools. I do know that um, it's a very fresh and ripe market. And so there are lots of people entering into this space. Um, and so um, I don't have a specific example. There, uh, there was a another question. Go I was going to say, I was looking at the question from Laura Davila about what are the traps that educators fall into that perpetuate the gender gap and are there small steps that you can make to improve? Uh, and so I think that I've covered some of those traps and looking at the, the culture wheel and understanding stereotypes and bias and micro messaging. And so there are absolutely small steps that you can take to improve. Um, one way to, to initiate this, not only in yourself and amongst your colleagues, is to have professional development. And so Mike, the Nate, the organization that I've worked with for the last decade, we've got tons of amazing curriculum that, that we can come in and support you and your colleagues and your staff and really beginning to address uh, educational equity as it relates specifically within STEM and career and technical education pathways. But at the end of the day, it's just really good teaching strategies. And so I certainly encourage you to look into that. You know, another thing that I encourage you to do do is read this book. It's called Blind Spot: Hidden Biases of Good People. This is a really good place to start about understanding bias. Um, another great book is called Cinderella Ate My Daughter. Um, that's understanding how gender, how, how we have become gendered, and how that's created a gap for our students. And so, um, another book that you can look at, um, or it's actually free to download on the internet, is called Why So Few. Uh, Women in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math by the AAUW. And so this report, again, I think is about 10 years old now, but uh, unfortunately we've not made any tremendous gains and, 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 and changes to this. And so this is a free report that you can read and it's got tons of great strategies available to you as well. And so um, 
Thanks for asking that question, Laura. I'm just going to take this one. Uh, I'm not sure what this is. What do you think about schools that give access to STEM school activities just to those students that are in GATE? Uh, I don't know what GATE is, so hopefully you can answer that. I think GATE means gifted and talented education. Um, okay. I think. <laughs> so I think that that's, that's really unfortunate. I think that some of the greatest scientists, engineers that we scientists and engineers that we have may not have been designated as high achievers or gifted and talented students early on. And, and what we do know to be true is that half of all jobs available in STEM are available to students with a two year degree or less. And so, again, if we perpetuate this single story of you have to have, you know, be a, you know, physics and calculus superstar to go into STEM. STEM, our STEM workforce is going to continue to, to the gap of, of workers is going to continue to grow. And so we should be changing how we talk about STEM so that students see that it's for everyone. We're all problem solvers. We can all be creative. These are learned skills. And, and it, you do not have to, to be one of those most uh, uh, high achieving students to go into those pathways. And so, yes, let's encourage more students across the continuum. Well, I'm going to wrap up because we, we've run out of time. And so I, I, uh, I really appreciate it, um, Megan, for, for your time today. Uh, it's been an inspiring conversation and I want to thank all of the people on the call for attending. If you have any further questions, send us an email and we'll put together a response document, and send it out to everyone. If you want to hear more about Coda Z and how you can use our learning environment to expand STEM to all students, please look at our website, gocodaz.com, and we can set up a demo or start a free trial there. Uh, we'll also like to invite you to join our online community of STEM professionals on Facebook called Robotics and STEM for All, and stay in touch with us through that. We'll be having another great STEM webinar in a couple of weeks, so watch your email and social media because we'll be happy to have you take part in one of our upcoming sessions. Uh, we'll be re sharing the recorded version of this session. So if there are any of your colleagues that you think would have benefited from this discussion, please share the link with them. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter uh, by searching for Go Code Z. Once again, uh, a million thanks to Dr. Pollock for sharing her knowledge and experience. And we'd like to thank you all for being here. May the code be with you.